I wish uh, one day I'm going to hit stop on that video <laughs> and everybody's going to see you dancing during the theme song. Dude, music my dancing is so good. Yeah. Yeah. Your dancing is, uh, is high quality. There's better than mine. Mine would not be good. I, so <laughs> I have the like lawnmower down and the shopping cart down and the Macarena down. That's about all I got. I can do the, the only thing I, I, I can class I can ballroom dance. My grandma taught me how, when I was low, we used to ballroom dance in her kitchen. Uh, but I can, yeah, there you go. I could definitely do all the moves to uh, Ice Ice Baby. I could dance to Ice that. Ice Baby. Dun, oh. dun, 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 dun. How are you today, Brad? Dude, it's been a week and a half. Yeah, it has definitely been a week and a half. And then allergies, and I, I don't know if masks are making my allergies worse or if I'm just getting older and allergies are just bad this year, but I am. <clears throat> when I'm in my, when I'm at home, just around my house, inside or outside, not going anywhere in public, no mask for like a week yeah. or so, I'm fine. But then two days of wearing a mask and like if I'm going out in public a lot or something and I have mask on for two straight days, oh, I'm just dying. Yep. Oh. I woke up this morning and I felt like I needed to take like a wire brush to my eyeballs. Yeah, that's exactly what I felt like. That's yeah. a good description. So... What show is this? Uh, I, I think I, people should know by now. But welcome to my live daily nutrition talk show, where we tell you how, where we work with you and help you try to make your dieting and nutrition and fitness goals sustainable, realistic, and achievable. The guy who asked me what show this is is Dr. Bradley P. Dieter. I am Jay. You don't really care who I am, um, but we are here. So you know, what, you know what my favorite part about our show intro is? What we have a script for it, and we literally never follow it. I have it memorized. <laughs> It's so funny. <laughs> I have it completely memorized. I don't know how you don't. It uh, is my brain. Hi, is everyone. Hi, everyone. Cool. Welcome back to MI Live, where we talk about how to make your nutrition, fitness, and nutrition and fitness goals realistic, sustainable, and achievable. I'm Jay White, and with me, as always, is Dr. Brad Dieter. If you have any questions, ask them throughout the show, and we'll get to them before we end. See, that's, I have that's, it memorized. That's pretty darn close. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Amber said, Buongiorno. Buongiorno, Amber. And Sarah says she wants pictures of me ballroom dancing, or you don't believe me. Uh, Only me if like, you're in like those ballroom dancing pants. Well, yeah, obviously. I, I have to go. I'm going to see my grandparents tonight, so I can, uh, me and my grandma can jitterbug, maybe. Do, 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 do. Oh, you got to get the finger up. It's got to have the finger. Yeah, finger in the air shaking. All right. So, Brad, we are talking. One of the things that came up on our last show, people had asked a couple, uh, a couple questions regarding some in the comments about nutrition things that are going on in the uh the crossfit world there were yeah. some some a, a, a uh it wasn't a podcast what was it it was a, a like video an, inter an interview <clears throat> an inter robber? yeah an interview that talked about how carbohydrates are bad the insulin response from carbs will make your muscles fall off and <laughs> i hope that's not what they that, said that's pretty much what he said i mean you've listened to him talk before that was, oh yeah it was pretty accurate uh, yeah. <laughs> um so and most of it um for anybody who has not listened to it is looking for it I'll, i would say don't um for anybody who heard it or heard the summaries of it uh brad almost all of the jaw-dropping things that were said we we're like oh my god this is horrible would you say that just knowing the two people who talked would you say it was true or false um blanket statement false false yeah i mean obviously there's some things that we don't know what was i haven't listened to it i don't know what was said but just knowing them hearing it previously um it's a lot of hoo-ha well i mean the hard part is it's i mean and we'll we'll dive into some of it here in a minute um i even have graphs and pictures pulled up today what is like you take some like kernel of a truth in a specific situation, and then you export that into a larger idea, and it just breaks down. Yeah, yeah, so. exactly. You take one thing, make it in. When you try to make, it, it's like I, I think it's like people who take IF when they take intermittent fasting and they take a tool in your toolbox, an idea, a, a valid principle, and they make it into a system. Yes. So we're actually going to talk about fasting today, aren't we, oh, Mr. J? We are. So let's jump into our first topic. Is Numero not uno. Numero uno is carbs and exercise. Oh, show. So does when we're talking about carbs, are we talking about specific types of carbs? Are we excluding specific types of carbs? Like all fructose is is included in this? Not? Um, so fiber. It kinda, yeah, it kind of depends. So what I would say is 
the best way to think about it is you have any form of glucose, whether that's like straight, um, like dextrose type glucose, or you have fructose, or you have uh, non digestible fiber, right? Um, those are really the three main ways to look at it in terms of overall metabolism, right? Your body will metabolize glucose from starch or, you know, just regular glucose syrup or anything like that. All very similarly. The only thing that will differ is the rate of like appearance of glucose in your system. So if you have very simple sugars, they appear faster. If you have more complex sugars, they appear slower, um, but they're all metabolized the same. Fructose is metabolized a little bit differently. And then fiber and all those sorts of things aren't really metabolized at all. So um, for all intents and purposes, they're really just um, either fermented in your GI tract or they pass through. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see my note up on the screen. Mm, you're not, you're non-digestible fiber. I mean, <laughs> I would say most days if you ate me, that's what I would look like. <laughs> All right. So we have, we have a bunch of different types of, of carbs. They all do different things in your body and do. So I, you know, this is a, a, a complex, a complex. And I mean, we could have a six hour discussion, I think on this there. Yeah. There's a lot in there. Where do you want to start the conversation on this? What points? So, do you want to start talking yeah. About? So I think the, the first points that I want to bring up is before you even think about the food side of things, you need to understand what is my body doing? doing during exercise like mm -hmm. as i ex increase my exercise intensity and duration what is my body using to provide fuel um and the nice thing is we actually have answers to those questions so i'm going to show um some figures here real quick and these are from a paper so if you are watching if you're listening to this on the youtubes or i mean on the podcast and you're not watching it on the youtubes just google uh, actually, I'll just put the link in the notes so people don't don't it. give a plug for a search engine in there. They didn't pay us for that ad. They make us pay for ads. Um, well, Google, you owe me a billion dollars. So I'm yeah. going to share this. I don't want to. I don't want to share my entire screen. I have all my important information pulled up there. So here's the. Uh, if anybody can't see the comment, Brad posted the link. Um, it's really long, so I'm not going to read it for the podcast. But if you went to PubMed and well, I can't see it now. I had the wrong one pulled up. Oh, this is the PDF. Oh, this okay. is what I wanted to show people. Never mind. Um, so if you click on this link, it'll take you to this PDF. So here's what I want people to kind of look at. So this graph right here, this shows you what your body is using for fuel at 25% of your VO2 max, which is like walking like a sloth, 65%, which is like a very very modest jog. Like that's, that's like a warm up jog. Um, and then 85% is like moderate intensity work. So at very baseline levels of physical activity, this is like maybe a warm up walk. You're using most of the energy is being, is being provided by plasma free fatty acids, such so as fatty acids floating around in your blood. Most of those come from either directly from your diet before they get stored or from your stored adipose tissue muscle triglycerides, which is fat stored in your muscles, or sugar that's floating around in your blood, right? That's a pretty minimal amount. Now, as you increase exercise intensity, here's what you'll notice. At 65%, your muscle triglycerides, so stored fat, you start to use more of, but then you really start to use quite a bit of muscle glycogen. So, and then you start to use a little bit of plasma glucose. So this is where I think people, the kind of the concepts start to break down. So Jay, mm -hmm. what, what dictates your baseline? So this is stored carbohydrates in your muscle. Yeah. That means you don't, that this means that this comes from carbohydrates that have been in your body for a while, right? You they, can't, yeah. yeah. You can't like consume this 30 minutes before exercise and then be like, oh, it's all going to show up as muscle glycogen. It yeah. will not. Right. So this is, this is stored muscle carbohydrate. Now, what happens if you do not consume an adequate amount of carbohydrates for weeks at a time. Your muscle glycogen is going to decrease. Yes. And so typically when you look at biopsy studies of people who are on ketogenic diets, their like percent of full muscle glycogen stores, 
I think the lowest I've seen is like 25, 30%, maybe even a little bit lower. I'd have to go look at the data again yeah. to maybe like a high of 50 to 60%. So you're, you basically are cutting the ability, the amounts of this stuff stored by like half. Okay. Right. Yep. So then as you go to even greater exercise intensity, you start using less stored fatty acids than you did at baseline. You start using more of the like, I need glucose. That's this is easy. This is like what you would consume during exercise or your liver would pump out during exercise. And this is what is stored, right? Mm -hmm. So your, your gas tank to do high energy exercise is or high intensity exercise is much smaller if you're consuming a low carbohydrate diet, right? That's really independent of all the other pieces. Um, and this is, this has been very well documented. Okay. So this is, this is exactly what happens. So now if you think about, okay, I'm a high intensity athlete, whether I'm a sprinter, a basketball player, uh, you know, a bodybuilder who's doing 60, 90 minute training sessions. I'm a CrossFit athlete. I'm doing any of these things. Your body's using quite a bit of muscle glycogen. And so you have to consume an adequate amount of carbohydrates over days, weeks, and months to ensure those stores um, stay elevated. Right. So so let me just summarize. Can I say, uh, pull that back up real quick? Oh. Well, just, and yeah, maybe you don't need to back up. I just want to summarize just to make sure that everybody who is, you know, anybody on the podcast is on the same page and anybody jumping in. <clears throat> so at rest or minimal, minimal activity levels, most of our um, energy source is coming from, uh, what is that? Uh, free uh, fatty acids in our bloodstream. Yep. Then as we increase to a little, to 65% of our max capacity. So a little, you know, uh, and I would say that's weightlifting pretty much. Um, uh, yeah, I would say most weightlifting or like a mod, a, a very light jog for three minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and that would be a, a fairly even breakdown between our free floating, uh, fats in our blood, uh, fatty acids in our bloods. Um, muscle stored fat in your muscle and a little bit on the higher end, but still pretty even of muscle glycogen stored carbohydrates in your muscle. Yep. Then as we go up to 85%, so you're jogging and this would be more of like an endurance athlete. Um, yeah, this would be more like, you know, somebody who's doing like a CrossFit type workout, um, somebody who's doing endurance exercise, et cetera. Okay. So, and then the majority of it is coming from our, our stored muscle glycogen and then equal equal smaller amounts that don't even equal 50 percent of the muscle glycogen we're using comes from muscle uh stored fats in your muscle free floating fats in your bloodstream and uh glucose glucose in your actual blood um instead of stored yep so i, I also want to emphasize this is not talking about this has no emphasis on on weight loss right this is not a this is what you're using for energy but calories in are going to equate at the time yep. your body bounces out the calories and and re and stores things that it doesn't need oxidizes other things so this has no bearing just because you hear you're using more glucose you're using more fat doesn't mean that you're burning more actual fat for weight loss yes correct okay perfect yep yep skis okay continue I can, I can stop sharing that um so so that's one piece um what was the other thing i was gonna make so now, if we go to like dietary pieces, right? Um, if we think about, I'm trying to find something else, but if we think about like what else do we know is we've actually done studies where we've taken people and we've given them, um, if you give people nicotinic acid, which is a B vitamin, it actually reduces their body's ability to oxidize fatty acids. And so we've actually looked at like, okay, what is like the rate limiting piece of high intensity exercise? Is it carbohydrates or is it fat? And so we've done studies where we've like given athletes uh, nicotinic acid. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Um, let, me, let me just double check that. Uh, yeah, nicotinic acid. And actually like watch their performance. And if you give them that, it has no bearing on their ability to do work. But if you limit their carbohydrate oxidation, their ability to work is severely hampered so that tells you that carbohydrate availability and carbohydrate metabolism um is 
the most important thing far and above fatty acid metabolism for higher intensity exercise. Okay. So have there, have there been studies done on, and it's, it's about carbs, but not about exercise. You know, have there been studies done on cognitive, um, cognitive ability, um, when you're on a, on a high fat, low carb diet? Yeah. So kind of neurocognitive function. Um, I know yeah. there have been, I don't really know that literature super, super well, to be totally honest. Okay. I'm just, I, I'm just curious since we use a lot of carbs for, you know, a lot of glucose for your brain. I'm just curious if that. Yeah. So I know there's, um, you know, there are studies that show like when you reduce carbohydrate availability, cognitive function can decline, you know, in the relative short term and stuff like that. But exactly what happens on the opposite when you have like elevated, um, fatty acid like when you switch to a ketogenic diet i'm not 100 percent sure i'd have to look into that so what you're saying is i should slam amps of d50 and i'll be a genius um d50 is uh glucose if anybody doesn't know dextrose probably not yeah I i'm gonna do that tonight i'm just gonna eat uh, 10 bags of gummy bears and see if that makes me smarter have i told you the story of when i was working on grizzly bears and we yes. were giving them um insulin boluses and watching their blood glucose drop to see how low it would get, see how insulin resistant they were. And my job was to flush D50 to keep their glucose from dropping too low. And it was so much D50. I mean, these were like, oh, they were huge. And I would, I probably put, I don't know, 2,500 grams of glucose into these bears or something absurd like that. That's a lot of glucose. Dude, it was nuts. It probably wasn't that much. I'm probably exaggerating, but it felt like that. So, What's next? Uh, on carbs and exercise? Yeah. Um, I don't know. What other questions do you have? About right. I, feel, well, let's get... I feel like that kind of answers that question. Yeah, I, I do too. I, I think that <clears throat> where where do you think in the, and we'll get to questions in a second, where do you think that this, the misconception that people are, are, are getting this, obviously there are, there are quote unquote experts out there, and maybe they are, maybe they aren't. That's why I'm using quote unquote. <laughs> um, experts out there saying, you know, don't have carbs there. It's bad for you. you. You can't, you can't do this. Where is outside of these, even with, even with experts say with, with people, big names in the industry saying that where, where are they getting this from? How are they not seeing the literature like you, like the majority, the vast majority, because, you know, one of the things that, that I, I think goes on in, in the world in general, not just not, not specifically in nutrition, not nutrition a lot is there's a, uh, this, science and i i believe you are on the same page this si silencing of disagreeing with science people who have different viewpoints they get silenced a lot um and and sometimes they're right i mean if you look throughout history it's happened often how, how do we know that they are not the ones who are being told to be quiet because it's going against the norm when they're actually right um that's a good question i don't know if i have an answer to that but i think one of the problems is we're kind of at the point in our availability of information in the way we educate people that we go from the top down approach. Like if somebody says, Hey, what is a good book to read on sports nutrition or nutrition in general? Generally the books that people recommend are like popular books, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, Hey, go read this. And my answer when people ask me is always, Go read um, the Grop textbook, Advanced Metabolism and Human Nutrition. It's like a basic biochemistry textbook because I think a lot of times we skip the basic fundamentals and we want to know like what's the most end real world pra practical application without having kind of the foundational knowledge. I mean, if you start at the primary literature and then work your way up, it, it you just get a much different picture because so you don't deal with people's interpretations who've maybe read summaries of the literature you actually read the primary sources itself so do you think part of it is that they are correct in a sense but they are applying it to a to to everyone versus a very specific subset and that's what they're missing i think that's part of it um i think the other thing is just misinterpretation of of the data of data right okay. like for example if you do a like a fat kinetics assay and you look at fat lipolysis versus fat esterification. So breakdown versus accumulation of fatty acids and you give somebody insulin and you measure that acutely, right? You will see 
If you give people insulin, it will be more lipogenic than lipolytic. Hmm. But when you then extrapolate that to how does my dietary carbohydrate affect actual um, fat mass change, that effect is meaningless because it's in a completely different context, right? So we take these kind of kernel truths um, and kind of really misinterpret them. So cl close your share screen for a minute because I'm going to take you off on topic, but off topic, and we'll come back to this. It's a good one, though. It's it's not a it's not a J rant where I'm talking about nothing. And we might not be able to do it today, but if you if you will do it on our next episode for a follow up, can you do a steel man argument? for that for why for for the view on um on the i don't know if we're saying any, on uh jason fong on his on his view for the carbohydrate model could you do a steel man argument on that and for anybody who does not know what while you're thinking about that brad for anybody who doesn't know a steel man argument it's a um you're you're using an improved version of an opponent's argument that is harder to defeat than the original argument <laughs> so you're 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 summarizing their views like you agree with them so you can understand them better um, yeah, I mean, I could concoct, I could concoct something. I mean, I, I could say something along the lines of like, Hey, from a very basic biochemical model, here's how we see the, the action of this occurring. As you have greater carbohydrate content in your diet, you're going to have more of this action occurring that promotes this type of environment. Um, there's data to support that. Um, generally speaking, when we look at populations of people who've switched from normal diets to higher carbohydrate diets, we have seen greater um, levels of adiposity. And so you can make these arguments that are very strong. Um, and kind of at first glance, they're, they appear to hold up, right? Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's that's part of the, the allure and part of the like, why I think a lot of us start from that premise of like, oh, this makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. let's go with that until you learn, like until you learn otherwise, right? Um, think about it like you're, you're looking to buy a house, right? Mm -hmm. You go in, somebody has remodeled the house. Like they've redone all the drywall, they've repainted, they've refurnished. And you're like, man, this house looks brand new and it's beautiful. And I really want to buy it. So you put in an offer on the house and you're, you're all gung ho. And then you bring the home inspector out and they're like, yeah, I mean, on the surface, everything looks great. Foundations cracked. We got to put in a new septic. We got to tear it out. Um, you know, we can only put a mound septic system in. It's going to cost you seventy grand for that. It's going to be forty grand for the foundation. And it's like all of the underlying architecture of what you're looking at mm -hmm. is fa is faulty, right? So yeah. that's that's okay. kind of what you know where we would be at, even with the, when you pull that steel man view together. Yeah, yeah. Steel man, steel man views. I I think that's that's how I. I, I don't, that's how I debate with myself. I don't debate anything with anybody except for myself. So I always make a steel man argument for things I read on Facebook or come up with their points. See, if I can see their viewpoint, then I've, I think I've, and I disagree. I think I've established mine. I think that that's a very underutilized tool in everything. Yep. Good job. I'm very proud of you for that, Brad. That was very, very good. And you did that very fast too. Bazinga. Oh my God. If, if anybody does not, does not know, I always, I always, when, whenever uh big bang theories on i always think that brad is a is a real is a non Shaman. yeah you, but but you're like a like he's an exagger an extremely exaggerated comical version of you though that's true i mean but but i mean as far as in real life i think that you're as close as somebody could get you know what's really funny is in my phd program in in our lab that was like kind of when big bang was really popular um, yeah. so it was, it was pretty fun but we had like most of those characters were people that I interacted with on a daily basis. <laughs> and you were the one who told everybody to leave you alone and just talked about toys. No, I would say <laughs> I was definitely the Leonard of our lab group. Oh, look at you, Mr. Cool. No, I mean, just like <laughs> that was me. We, we definitely had a Sheldon and she's probably one of my favorite people ever. Uh, okay. What screen did you have pulled up? Uh, is it back up? No. So uh, this was just some data showing, um, dun, 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 dun. so this is change in glycogen content, um, okay. with diet. So imagine like this is a cyclist who goes from a regular diet to a 27% carbohydrate diet. So mm -hmm. they start it. I don't know. It looks like 140. <laughs> I hate these type of plots. It's always so hard to see exactly where stuff's at. 
This is somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 to 160 millimoles per kilogram. And after just seven days of a 27% carbohydrate diet, which is really not even like ketogenic levels or very low carbohydrate diets, um, you're looking at, I mean, that appears to be somewhere in like that 60 to 80 range. Mm-hmm. So you've cut your glycogen stores almost in half after seven days. That's not great. No, that would no. be that would be bad. And since we we talked about earlier, that is the in in high intensity exercise that it's from. If we're on a ketogenic diet, we are killing our high energy capacity. Yeah, and you see, like here's some actual output stuff. So mean mm-hmm. power and peak power. I mean, you see a twenty percent power reduction after six weeks. And, and and what kind of exercise was that in? Uh, this would have been cycling. In cycling, okay. So not yeah. so 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 nothing that, a, that a built. wind gate performance. So, oh, the, horrible! Yeah. <laughs> I not I would great. I had to do I, I've done two VO two max tests on a treadmill, and when I finished my last one, like, do you want to do you want to do a a wind gate test for us uh, next week? And I, I just looked at him, laughed, and I never went back to help them out. Dude. I would never want to do for anybody who doesn't know a wind gate test. They put you on a bike and just keep adding resistance to it. And it just they drop the weight. Yeah, oh, that's what they call it. That's yeah, because they add more weight onto it. Yeah, dude, it's terrible. And then oh. you see, you'll see like studies where people are like they did seven weeks of uh, six wind gates a day, and I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, who would want to do that? Crazy dude. people. Brad Morgan would probably do it. He'd be like, yeah, give me more wind gates. That's probably true. All right. So, are we ready for some questions? Um. Yes. All right. Um. Let's see. Jenny Morales said, good morning. Good morning, Jenny. Julie Pinkerton said, good morning. Uh, Hi from Australia to a random Facebook person. Hello from Chicago in Spokane. Uh, Jenny said she still has a picture in her mind of me with a beard, and she didn't almost recognize me. LOLs. Yeah, I I wake up some mornings, and I like go to scratch the beard, and I'm like, what the hell happened to me last night? Uh, Sarah said, carbs are life. Heathens. (laughs) Um, Jenny said, I'm a lover of carbs. There's Brad's comments. Uh, Brad, are we in our next topic? We're talking about diabetes. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, type, two. type two. Oh, it is type two. Yeah. Type, oh, type one. Um, nothing we can really do for it. Well, no, that's not entirely true. But there's, no, there's it's just nothing. a much. They're they're two completely fundamentally different disease states. Yeah. There you go. That's that's what I meant. Not nothing we can't do can do for you can manage it. I just didn't mean like there's nothing we can do to. Correct it. Never mind. My thought process is different early here. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. Somebody said that George uh, or I said this is as clear as mud. <laughs> You're clear as mud. Whoa. Firing shots from Dr. Dieter. Bang. I mean, I mean said hi. This is a mean from India. Hi, I mean. Um, Brad, what percentage of carbs should be fun carbs? All of them should be fun. Yeah, if my carbs are mean, I don't want them. Do you hear my dog barking? No, nobody, nobody listening on the podcast hears that dog, that loud dog barking at all. I'll let you continue talking for a second while I meet myself. All right. Um, I wouldn't put a percentage of carbs that should be fun. What I would say is that if, if you know, you could break it down where you're going to track actual fiber, and I, I believe it's it's at about 14 grams of fiber uh, per thousand calories. I believe is is what the USDA recommends. Um, but I would, <clears throat> what uh, instead an easier way to do it is, you know, we we aim for seventy to eighty percent of our of our foods from whole, minimally processed, nutritious foods, and the other thirty to twenty to thirty percent from from really whatever you want. If you're following that general balance with with really well balanced, minimally processed meals for the large majority of your your daily and weekly meals, you wouldn't need to worry about things like 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 fiber fiber additional sugar because you're you're in a calorie balance and foods that are minimally processed are going to have more fiber naturally. Um, if it is an issue, you can track your fiber, but I wouldn't actually just track added sugar. It, yeah. it, it, it's, a, it, it's just so much work and not a good bang for your buck, in my opinion. Obviously, if you have, you know, if you're a diabetic, maybe Brad might tell you that might change. Um, but in it, overall, I, I would just track carbs and maybe fiber at the most. Yeah, and then I think she asked for some clarification too. Um, I think maybe we answered the wrong question because of the the word fun. But she said um, also oh. what percent of calories <laughs> should be from carbs. Um, the Young answer girl. there is, and I hate this answer, is it depends. Um, I mean, anywhere from 
you know, 5% in some cases to 80% in some cases, right? Yeah. If you're a, if you're an ultra marathon runner and you're running 20 plus miles a day at a pretty high intensity, you're probably going to need 80% of your stuff from carbs. Um, if you're somebody who, you know, really is pretty sedentary, um, you know, has a minimal calorie intake, probably needs a higher, a higher protein percent. Um, and you generally just don't like carbohydrates, you're probably closer to that 15%. Um, so it just really just depends on each person. So there's really no set number of percentage. The other, the other thing that I think that's important whenever we have this discussion is we generally think of things in percentage, but the body doesn't work in percentages. It works in the actual amounts you're consuming, right? So 80% of your diet from carbs could be 10 or could be a thousand. Um, and your body cares more about whether it's 10 or a thousand than whether it's 10% or 80%. Okay. I agree. Percentage. Okay. I, I mean, I work in percentages, a hundred percent kick ass all the time. I don't know what percentage you work in, but you know, that's just me. That, that just reminded me of one of my favorite movie scenes of all time. What's that? I'm here to chew bubble gum and kick ass and I'm all out of bubble gum. All I can think of is. Have you ever seen that movie? No, all I can think of is a is a is a version of that quote from. If what is that? What's that from? It's called They Live. Okay, so it's in like the movie, what what year the was the movie made? Third movie ever, nineteen eighty eight. The year I was okay. born. Okay, so in in uh <clears throat> in Dazed and Confused, they're standing on the moon tower party, and he's like, "I only came here to do two things: kick some ass and drink some beers." Looks like we're almost out of beers. Yep, and then it gets to no fight later. Like that's it, it's it's the best. That that is my all time favorite. I think I've seen that. I watched it so many times when it came out. I broke the VHS tape and then burned out the DVD. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, Amin asked, increasing carbs while bulking and cutting down carbs gradually to get the body fat percentage down. How do we manage to get the body fat percentage down very low? How do we manipulate carbs or play around with carbs? Um, yeah, so I would say there's a few answers to this. Um, the The easiest answer is getting to very low percent body fat generally requires uh, a pretty large energy deficit per a extended period of time. Um, and what I find for most people to actually get to very low body fat percentages is to maintain a moderate amount of calorie intake and a higher level of exercise. Like you could, in theory be at 700 calories a day of intake and 1200 calories a day of expenditure. But I generally find people who are maybe at closer to like 15, 16, 1700 calories a day and expending, you know, 2,500 calories, 3000 calories a day generally have better results in terms of getting body fat super low. Um, now, as you get to very low calorie intakes and very low body fat, several things start to happen that kind of impede progress. One is, your non-exercise activity drops to your training intensity and volume drops and your recovery drops and your thyroid hormones drop, et cetera. Um, so generally what I tell people is as you get lower in your calories and your body fat, you need to be more mindful of when you're consuming your carbohydrates and that you're getting an adequate amount of carbohydrates throughout a week. So you may have days where it's very low carbohydrates and then you may have refeed days where they're higher to promote you know, recovery, keeping thyroid hormones, et cetera. The other thing that I've just found anecdotally from my own coaching experience as well as from the scientific literature is as you get to kind of very low levels of body fat, your physique is generally better and your hormone profile and such are generally better if you adopt kind of a, a moderate carbohydrate approach it's generally much better than a very low carbohydrate approach at least that's my general experience your experience is good enough for everybody brad well i hope not brad before we move on to our next topic i have a question what would that what be? sound does this make those are my keys <laughs> Uh, that was a good one those are my keys for anybody in the podcast i wanted to see what that, that is am, probably that is one of my favorite random games of all time i just posted a uh the link to this movie scene <laughs> oh my god 
you you need to watch it later. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Well, we just spent 35 minutes talking about uh, that first topic. So um, before we go on to the next topic, if you would like a coach to help you figure out how to fuel yourself with carbohydrates for training and for weight loss, please go to macrozinc.net. And if you're really feeling fancy, go to macrozinc.net slash services. Sign up got for the coaching. Got today. a two-week free trial. Sign Don't up. Wait. Talk to a coach. Uh, work with one of our coaches. We have coaches in six countries, clients on six continents. Um, I, I, I think we now cover every time zone pretty efficiently. North America, um, we finally have a coach in the East Coast. We have not had one ever in the East Coast. We have two now, two coaches in the East Coast. Tom's in New York. So we have coaches on the East Coast, in Europe, uh, in the UK, in Australia. Um, so we cover pretty much everywhere. But come on, schedule uh, Sign up for the trial, talk to a coach, see what's going on, see if it's something we can help you with it. If it is, stick around for a little while, make your goals, and learn something. Um, if you're feeling extra, extra, extra fancy, go to www. No, there's no www. I'm going to start putting a thing on there when they go to www.macrosinc.net. It automatically sends you an email so that you, you can know everybody who does that. I don't know. It's going to do something. You cray. Oh, I'm tired. Um, all right. What's our next topic, Brad? Fasting and diabetes. Fi fasting and diabetes. So are we talking about, just to clarify, I know we had the question earlier, but not everybody might have been here. Um, are we talking about type 1 or type 2 or both? Dose. Type 2. Type dose. Okay. Perfect. Yes. So <clears throat> just like we did with the last one, what do you, um, what is the overall arching picture that you want to cover with this? What about fasting and what about diabetes? Yeah. Um, I think we'll maybe keep this one a little bit higher level and we can maybe go into the weeds on this on like its own episode. Um, but fasting is a tool that can be used to help address one of the fundamental causes of diabetes, um, which type two is generally a result of energy overload, um, which is, we also will often call diet or obesity, right? Um, so generally speaking, diabetes type two generally manifests from a few kind of fundamental physiological processes that are precipitated by energy overload. Um, so increased fat storage in places where it shouldn't be or too much in places where it should be. Um, that is that's generally kind of the, the most basic underlying cause. Now, fasting is a great tool to help address the energy overload, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can do that either through just general caloric restriction or fasting is a way to kind of facilitate caloric restriction. Um, there may be some small additional benefits that occur from a metabolic perspective from going longer periods without eating. So if we, if we hold all calorie deficits equal... Could there be some additional benefit to fasting? It is likely in some cases that it can be a little bit more beneficial, but we're talking really splitting hairs at that point. Okay. I don't I don't even know where to go from that. I don't know either. Where do you want to go from that? I wouldn't mind going to like Las Vegas. Dude. Oh, you might on this topic. Um, why we're on the topic of diabetes, this is this is very interesting. So uh this this is kind of on topic, but kind of off topic. But we're here, so um, yeah, it's our show. The, and I have the microphone, so I'll do whatever I want. Uh, so one of the one of the major complications that occurs from diabetes is kidney disease, mm -hmm. right? Um, which, generally speaking, for most people who have diabetes and kidney disease, it is once you have established disease, the only options are wait until it gets bad enough until you are on dialysis and get a kidney transplant. Um, there has not been a lot of progress in terms of drug development for that. So when I was in my postdoc fellowship, that's what we were working on was drug development for diabetic kidney disease. Um, there's some new drugs on the market that appear to slow the decline, but nothing really reverses it. However, there has been some evidence in the medical literature that if you catch people with early to moderate stage kidney disease and 
this is in type one people. So it's a little bit different, but the same kind of philosophy applies. And you do a pancreas transplant, all of their structural issues with their kidneys are reversed. Really? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, That's pretty interesting. Did Mike Maurer, I think. Let me see if I can find the paper. So, are, are, while you're looking for that, are people with, you know, we have, we obviously have a, a kidney disease issue that comes along with, with, with diabetes. Should people with diabetes be watching their protein intake? Question one. And then there's another one. Yeah. So I would say if you have type two diabetes, um, there's kind of two pieces. If you are kind of early in the disease process of type two diabetes, I would, I would leverage the protein intake to help you lose weight. And if you can use that to help you lose weight, um, you reduce most of the risk of the long-term outcomes of kidney problems from obesity and diabetes, right? Now, if you're at a later stage, um, I would be much more cognizant of what's going on with your kidneys and maybe limiting protein, right? I would maybe leverage some other tools for caloric restriction. Is that, is, you said type two, so type one different? Um, no, type one, if you have type one diabetes, and it's well managed. I wouldn't be too worried about your protein intake. Okay. Um, if you have type one and it's not well managed, and you do have some vascular complications right. and some reduced kidney function, I would be um, cognizant of your protein intake. Um, I have a full oh. lecture on this that I can give at some point. Maybe I'll give it to just the group in general. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so, so my follow question two on that is protein and insulin. So, it, how much? For a type one or type two diabetic, how much of a difference does it make not having that insulin response with protein, or does it even make a difference? Because you know, when we have protein, it does trigger an insulin response. Some yeah. it triggers insulin, and and how are they not utilizing protein efficiently? Does it not make a difference? And if it doesn't make a difference, then why do people without diabetes do it? Um, so this is this is kind of one of those good questions where it, dif it differentiates type one and type two, right? Type okay. one is you don't make insulin, right? So when you right. consume protein as a type was as a person with type one diabetes, we don't call them type one diabetics anymore. A person with type one diabetes. Wait, um, what? That's what they're called now. Yeah, that's the, it's it's kind of like we in the medical literature don't say obese people; we say people with obesity because huh. it's a it's a condition. You don't define a person based on their condition; you just say they are a person with a condition, which is more accurate. Um. Medicine has changed a lot since I was in school, apparently 15 years ago for, for, yeah. for things. So like... somebody, a person with type 1 diabetes, when they consume protein, they do not have any insulin response because okay. they have no insulin to produce, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So their anabolic response to protein without consuming exogenous insulin is low, right? No, it's, okay. It's, it's basically... I don't want to say non-existent, but it's lower, right? So, so they have to consume exogenous insulin to get the maximal anabolic signal out of the protein intake. So if you're a type one, if you're if you are a type one diabetic, or if, if you have type one diabetes, you would, and you take a whey protein shake, you should also take insulin with it. Um, I wouldn't say with it. I would say just taking your insulin per prescription per okay. Okay. Right? okay so ma make sure your 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 blood sugar level is balanced and even yeah make sure your blood sugar okay. levels are balanced and even and that you're getting an adequate amount of insulin so here's okay. and, and here's one of the other the other pieces so a lot of times people will say hey you know if you're not producing insulin if you're a type 1 diabetic you should immediately adopt a low carb diet so you don't have to take exogenous insulin <clears throat> well that's not great because your body needs insulin like mm -hmm. you produce it not just to manage blood sugar but to do a lot of other things right it it has anti-catabolic effects. It has some anabolic effects. Um, it's got other hormonal effects, right? The the insulin growth factor axis, mm -hmm. like those are all very important things. Um, yeah. So you know, realizing that is important. Mm -hmm. um, so like people who are like, oh, I'm type one diabetic. I'm just going to go super low carb, so I never have to take insulin, and my medication is lower, and my cost is lower. I'm like, that's that makes some sense, but we also have to remember like you're always going to be in a catabolic state and that's not great. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as far as like illegal performance enhancing drugs, steroids go, 
uh, insulin is the most abused anabolic steroid in the in the world, more abused than testosterone. It's, most, it's probably the most dangerous, and it's definitely the most dangerous. I th- I've said this before in here. The when I was a paramedic, the only two times I ever picked up a dead person from uh, a, a dead bodybuilder, both times they were uh, injecting insulin, and it went horribly wrong. This is how good my brain is, Jay. I remembered this paper. Oh my god! So these are people who had. Um, I think they were. Let me just. I think they were type one. They they, they may have been type two. Yep. So these were people with type one diabetes who had. Oh, uh, at the onset, they had major early glomerular lesions, mesangial expansion, and increased thickness of the GBM. So that was so these of are course. people with moderate to advanced kidney disease. Okay. And so like this, see all this stuff? Okay, this is a picture of a cell for anybody in the podcast. This is a picture of a picture. glomerulus. And this what's a glomerulus? Is, um it's a cell. It is, it is the it is a part of your kidney that is where all of the filtration of your blood occurs. Okay. It's a part of your nephron. It's part okay. Um that, so, that word I understood. So all this stuff. Okay. This is badness. All the pink? Yep. See how it's like this diffuse pink? That's like fibrotic. Okay. Essentially. I mean, we could we can argue that later. But um, <laughs> now after 10 years after a pancreas transplant, look how much better the kidney is. Yeah, it looks much it's better. Back to normal. That's crazy. So from a pancreas t- transplant, there's evidence that a pancreas transplant will improve kidney function because you have better insulin response. Yeah, so that's probably you have some better glucose control, but probably the actual insulin being present and some of the other things the pancreas does. So kidney. So now wrapping this all up because I know you and you could talk about kidney health all day. It's like your 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 topic. How does this and, and diabetes? How does this wrap into fasting? Um just like we talked at the top of the <laughs> at the top of the topic. Oh, let's sum- okay, let's summarize again because it's been a, a long. It's been a very scientific topic. It's been an arduous journey through this topic. Um, fasting is a great tool for cl- controlling caloric intake. Right, hunger management tool. Hunger management tool. There may be some small additional metabolic oxidative stress, inflammatory benefits to fasting on top of just caloric restriction, but. Caloric restriction gives you 90 to 95% of those benefits. So if, is it better to, and building on the fasting thing, is it, would it be better to, for manage to have, uh, for, for, to, would it be better for a diabetic to spread out their carbohydrate intake low evenly throughout the day or take the same amount of carbs and have them at once? Type one or type two. Yes. Uh, trying to lose weight or trying to build muscle? Uh, we'll go trying to lose weight because that's probably the average person. Um, so if you're trying to lose weight and you're a type 2, um, it won't really make a big difference. Okay. My thought process is always it's probably more the area under the curve that matters, right? So it's like how much total glucose load am I being exposed to? Right. Um, and there may be some benefits to having it all at once. And there may be some benefits to spreading it out based on the individual person. Okay. Um, so I don't know if there's a good blanket answer for that. Unfortunately. How about, how about for type? I mean, would it, would it change your assuming that, you know, a type one is and it's being managed appropriately with the appropriate levels of insulin and things like that and the appropriate type of insulin, would that make a difference in a one C levels on carb consumption at once or carb consumption evenly throughout a day? Um, that's a good question. I know, I think there's been, uh, research on that, but I don't know if I have read enough of it to have a good handle on it. My, my gut feeling is still that it is, um, total exposure. Yeah. That, that, that's kind of where I'm, what I'm thinking too, especially with, with a type one, cause you could get lo- different types of insulin, long lasting instant. And I think that as long as you Yep. spreading it out it would matter how about for muscle building because that was one i did not think of that you brought up yeah so i would say for muscle building i'm going to lean more towards it's way better to have it um like spread out throughout the day just like protein for ones and twos uh for ones and twos but generally speaking 
people with type two diabetes generally don't have a major muscle building need. Yeah. Um, right. They, they have more of a weight loss need. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting stuff. If anybody has any questions on this, feel free to ask Brad, do you have anything that you want to say again on that? Or did we cover everything that you wanted to on that? Cause I, 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 I honestly, we could learned, go for hours. Yeah. I learned, I learned quite a bit on it. The, the pancreas transplant, uh, was interesting. And that, that pancreas transplant thing you were talking about for improving renal function, that's for type one or two or both. Um, so far that data is only in type, type one, one that right. I'm aware of, Okay, which, which makes more sense. Yeah. So perfect. So in summary, just to summarize every single thing that we talked about today, we had a, we had a big day. Uh, Brad only came here to do two things, uh, chew gum and kick ass and he's almost out of bubble i gum. have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass and i'm all out of bubble gum oh my lord um God, so, you have you have to watch that scene i it's will watch so that cool. clip uh so car carbs and exercise was our first topic um brad carbs are, oh that, i did have a follow-up on carbs and exercise actually in my um in our in our if needed topic if we run short on time and so carbs and exercise building on that with, with, with breaking down the charts that you talked about earlier, you had, um, you know, at, at let's say weightlifting capacity at weightlifting, average weightlifting, a two to three minute jog. Um, uh, most of our, most of our body's energy source is coming from free floating fatty acids still. Correct. Um, I would say you're getting closer to that 65% even at that. So you're getting a mix of both. You're getting closer. You're talking about 65%, 65% VO2 max. Yep. Yeah. 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 So you're getting a mix, but you are it, on that chart. It still showed a little bit in favor of more fatty acid. Yes. Oxygen. Okay. Um, would you say that intra workout carbs for something that's at like 65% of your VO2 max? So like you, you hear it a lot with power lifters. They were lifting real heavy for, you know, they're doing, they're doing heavy triples and they're doing five sets of triples at, you know, 90% of their one rep max. And, mm -hmm. And they're and in between, you know, or even after that huge set of trip, that huge set of triples, or in or during that set of triples, they'll take some intra, they'll take gummy bears or intra workout carbs, um, something you know that's basically just pure sugar. Is that just that since that's not their main energy system? Is that would it be better to take something that's well, it wouldn't be better to take something that's fatty. Um, would it be better to keep doing that? Or is that just a psychological thing at that point? Um, I would say that's probably a little bit more of a psychological thing than anything. Okay. Huh. Interesting. Cause I, I mean, I've gotten shaky when I, when I, when I was doing stuff like that, I would get shaky and have yeah, car go better. And sometimes that can be from like, so high intensity exercise like that will cause like norepinephrine release and that'll change fatty acid okay. metabolism. The other thing that can occur is that sufficiently high intensity even if it's short duration you actually mm -hmm. you will actually get fatty acid mobilization from your fat tissue but it won't make it to your muscle tissue yeah because you have your circulation changes so the ability of your body to transport fatty acids from your peripheral fat tissue to your muscle tissue is impaired okay uh, so that's you may be the only thing you may be able to get to your muscle tissue is the freshly consumed that makes sense um glucose that you just consumed okay that makes sense thank you for clarifying a couple questions uh teresa said good morning i have an off topic question is collagen a supplement that's worth it to take i've seen a lot of people who are taking it i wonder if it's worth the money um i would say collagen's in my top five of supplements i would take as a daily basis to cover any potential new potential nutritional shortages ha has it always been in your top five no because I remember we had we had talks about it before a couple of years ago and it was not in nope. there. What what made the I, what made you change your mind on it? Um to be honest, uh conversations with colleagues of mine who knew more about it than I did. Interesting. Yeah. So people who showed me some data that was like, hey, this is this is the role that glycine plays in a lot of your structural components. Here's some data from comparative biology of what happens with glycine shortages over a lifespan. Um Here's how much you get in your diet. Here is what you know consuming collagen supplements provides. Interesting. So can I just eat jello all day? You can, yeah. You can eat gelatin. Yeah, I'm just gonna eat jello all day. It's so much better. I mean, it may not be the same. I don't know to be honest. It will be. It will be. Jello is 
greatest. You'll be the uh, same. Uh, Cindy had asked earlier um, if the Facebook Lives are put on YouTube or how can we see the replay. So you can always see the replay if you go to the Facebook group, macrosinc.net slash free group, or just go to Facebook, search for Macros Inc. Um, and you can search in Facebook for MI Live. You'll find these. You can go to macrosinc.net slash YouTube, and they'll take you right to our YouTube channel where all the lives are broadcast live. Some of you guys are watching on there. Um, and you can view all the previous lives or you can go to macrosync.net slash podcast and you can view, you can link up to your favorite podcasting service and listen to us on their podcasts are delayed by about a week. Cause we edit the, uh, the intro and the outro out. Um, and that just takes a week for us to edit a 20 second clip <laughs> to edit. It takes maybe 10 minutes, but that's but to- a lot to- to get that te- that ten minutes takes me a week. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was like, somebody for a project I was working on, they asked me, I was like, "Hey, how far are you on this?" I was like, "Dude, I haven't even started that." You're like, "Well, why not? It doesn't take that long." I was just like, "Honestly, it hasn't been a priority." Yeah, like, no, no. At least you're honest about it. And I was like, "I know." I yeah. Yep. That's that's most things. It doesn't take me very long. It's just I have about a list. I I have I literally have an entire wall. That I'm looking at right now, I have a dry erase wall in my office, and I'm looking at an entire wall of things that I have, and I'm like, "Huh, most of these things take five minutes, but when we put them all together, it takes three years." So, Jay, do you want to see a really bad day? Sure. Do you know what that is? That's a Ferrari. That's a Ferrari F40. So that's like a 1.5 million dollar car that somebody I know just ran off the road and totaled. Brad, you want to hear a really dirty joke? It's not great. We'll see if YouTube will like knock us off for it. Please. All right. Boy fell in the mud. Nah. <laughs> Want to hear a clean joke? He took a shower. That's that's so good. Have you not heard that before? I always heard it was, you want to hear a dirty joke? A pig fell in the mud. Oh. That's what I always heard. No. no. Oh, I have a good one. This may This may actually be very insensitive. <laughs> Do it. What do you call a guy with no arms and no legs floating in the ocean? Oh my God, this is going to be insensitive because I know the answer. What, Bob? Yeah, that's you're a, <laughs> you're a horrible person. You just insulted Bob's everywhere. My grandfather. Isn't that terrible? My grandfather is very upset. There's like a whole line of these jokes. Do you know my grandfather? My my grandfather is named Bob. My dad, who is on the opposite side of the family, is my. It's not his 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 dad is named my my dad's named Bob. My grandfather's Bob. My dad's dad is Bob, Lisa's dad is Bob, and Liam's middle name is Bob. So you're now Bob. I am not a Robert. I'm gonna call you Bob. And actually, my and, and my great grandfather was was Bob. And actually, my grandfather is both of them were. Um, my grandfather is actually James and goes by Bob. So I don't really know how that works, but you know. Well, so anyway, um, well, Bob. We, now that is, we're now that we're done. What day is today? Today is the today seventeenth. Yeah, Friday seventeenth. We are done for the week. We'll be back on Monday. I got a whole series that we're going to talk. Brad and I have our weekly, our weekly, one of our many weekly meetings after this. And Brad, no idea what you're talking about. What? No idea what you're talking about. Yeah, no. See ya. Um, I I think that we're gonna we're gonna we were doing this macros 101 101 thing the past couple days. So I think in the next couple weeks we're going to be wrapping that up, keeping it going. Yeah, following our ebook. I have. a, b- a bunch of ideas I, on my on my wall. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve. Twelve ideas right now uh, f- for our future shows in, in an order, in a series order, not just the random topics when we find one. Um, so this was a one-off one because Brad said we were going to talk about today. So next next episode, we will be back with that Macros 101 series, and we will be covering. I can even tell you if I can find it, and I can't find it, of course. Um I think it's weighing foods. Oh, that seems like I don't tell you. Seems like an important one. Yeah, and and again, anybody who's listening, sometimes we cover we cover these. Uh, you know, we might cover one of these topics once every other month or something. But if we're going to record a, a macros one hundred and one thing and just keep going over it, so we are actually going to cover um, uh, weighing and measuring food and the basics of tracking next week. We might do we'll do weighing and measuring food very in the very beginning because it's short and easy. Then tracking. Um, and then after that, we'll jump into meal planning and how to track your progress. So, Brad, Word. Um, yeah. if anybody's looking for coaching, where can they go? I would go to macrosinc.net slash services. 
and I would sign up for coaching. And I would probably be feeling real bougie on a Friday and just go st- sign up straight for the complete coaching package. Yeah, it, it's actually funny how many uh, <clears throat> I, I was just I was going over numbers last night. It's kind of interesting how many people sign up for the trial. Message me, say I'm just doing the trial, I'm just doing the trial, and then not even not it, like the minute they get off their consult with their coach, they say, yeah, no, I'm doing the, I, I absolutely want to do the complete coaching. Um, and then they get delayed on their training program by a week because they have to wait for their coach to get to sign. So if you sign up, you can get that done right away. Um, I would yeah. definitely go, but there's no two week free trial with that. I want everybody to know there's no two week free trial because a lot of work goes into programs. They are hundred percent custom design uh, made weekly for you. So every week you get a new training program from your coach, then they adjust it. They make adjustments to your sets, reps, weight, lifted exercises, uh, program completely. Uh, you can send them videos. So they'll give you feedback, stuff like that. So Brad, what else do you have? Is that it? Are we done? Um, the only thing I have left is that we will be on here on Monday at the same macro time, the same macro channel on the same macro channel. I wish I never would have started saying that. Oh, I love it. It's my favorite thing ever. Oh my God. It was supposed to be same bat time, same bat channel. I don't know what that means. Batman. Old Batman, same bat time, same bat channel. Oh, well, right. I guess, I guess that makes sense. Then you make sense. Well, um, everybody have a safe weekend. I'm probably going to get sunburnt, um, increase my risk of skin cancer, and I will be back on Monday. I will be working all weekend, unlike you, who will be in the sun enjoying life. Some of us have to work. Well, I mean, I'll be working, but I'll be in the sun too. <laughs> all right, thanks for watching, everybody. We will see you on Monday. Bye.